Hello everyone, this is Fahed from Audiobookish. I'm joined today by Poppy. Hello. And we're also joined today by a special guest. We're joined today by the author of Flamingo Fashion, Samantha Hunter. Samantha is a full-time mum to a little boy and girl. She previously worked as a management consultant. Flamingo Fashion is her first book and she was inspired to write the story due to the power of its message. We are perfect the way we are and being yourself never goes out of style. Poppy, would you like to introduce the book? Very definitely. I'm super excited by this. It's wonderful to talk to you, Sam. So Flamingo Fashion is a book for young children, three to six years, written by Samantha Hunter, read by Michael Maloney, audiobook illustrations by Maggie Roberts, and activities in collaboration with Jolly Bookworms. Fabulous Freddy and Fifi are two fashionista flamingos who decide to style other animals on the savannah in fluffy pink feathers. They create silly outfits that have calamitous results, which soon teaches them that we're all perfect just the way we are. All audiobook and Kindle sale profits will be donated to Lit World, a non-profit organisation supporting the development of children's literacy around the world. Buy this book for your child and open a new chapter for someone else's. Hello, Sam. Um, how are you? Hi. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, not as excited as me, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so could you uh, just tell us a little bit about the book? Yes, well, Poppy just did a really great overview of the synopsis. So it's all about Freddie and Fifi and their creative ambition to style other animals on the savannah in fluffy pink outfits. And their creativity gets a little bit away from them, shall we say. Okay. And the animals they design creations for soon learn that it's not fit for purpose in their environment and come back with something to say about it. <laughs> So Freddie and Fifi learn the invaluable lesson that we are all perfect the way that we are and seek to resolve the creative mess they made, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, it's so lovely. And the thing I love most about that message, I think, is that not only is it kind of a personal, you know, learn to be happy with the way you are, you're designed to be you. Um, and, you know, you don't need to look like other people. You don't need all those changes. But then also on the flip side, Freddie and Fifi learned that they don't need to change everyone else. There's a lot to be gained from working with other people, other animals, uh, that are all different and really celebrating each other's differences. So yeah, I really love that. Yeah, I guess I didn't sit down when I wrote the book to think about what's the value and message I want to promote with this story. It's, It's funny how the creative process works. So after the birth of my son four years ago, I actually wrote a book about a flamingo with a pair of magic shoes who traveled the world called Freddy's Fantastic Adventures. And I realized that I had written some really great creative content, but it was a long time ago since I was seven, which is what Mm -hmm. the book was pitched at. And I really wanted to do something with it. The creative design never left me. I had unfinished business with Freddy the Flamingo. And after the birth of my daughter, walked past a hair salon. (laughs) And I don't know why, (laughs) maybe it was in a fit of hadn't had enough sleep. (laughs) Asked myself the question, what if flamingos opened a hair salon? And therein was born the idea of having Freddie and Fifi open a fashion boutique. And I Mm -hmm. think the message came out as the story did. And I realized that that's basically the message that my parents raised me with my entire life. So that's how it all came out. (laughs) That's fabulous. So flamingos came to you. Um, Are (laughs) flamingos your favorite animal? Is it someone else? It's a very good question. Where did the flamingos come from? I just uh, bought my son a Marks and Spencer's t-shirt in 2017, which had a flamingo caricature on with a pair of trainers on. And for whatever reason, it really inspired me because I just started rereading children's books, which obviously Mm. we all put down once, you know, we've, I I guess, (laughs) graduated (laughs) from childhood. I I know I'm now learning there's a big community of people out there that love children's picture books. And I am so in that community now. But I have to admit that I stepped outside of it for, I Mm -hmm. guess, a good 20 years. (laughs) I forgive you. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I've I've come back with a bang. So I think that's all right. Um, (laughs) But yeah, that was where the inspiration came from. It was t-shirt starting to read again and I've always been a creative person I used to write children's picture books for fun when I was a child whilst I went to my mum's office while she was working so I guess the creative hobby I had as a child found me again oh that's lovely 
are there any kind of archives of those that you're going to dig into for future projects? <laughs> Uh, the only one I remember doing was a one about a badger and then one about a ghost called Ghoulie, which was put down very quickly when my <laughs> mum couldn't stop laughing at the name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a good sign, really, I think. Yeah. Goofy Making, Ghoulie, that's so yeah. good. Making adults giggle, I think so, is a good sign. Definitely, it's a yeah. classic feature of a good pitch book. <laughs> yeah. Completely agree. We were talking about picture books, but... From what we understand, this is kind of an audio first release. And I was just wondering why audio instead of the picture book yes. route. So the reason why I went audio book, so it is only an audio book for now. Would I like it to be a fully fledged picture book one day? M maybe. When I first wrote it, that was the intent. And I I finished it in January 2020 and then started getting ready to send it to publishers that took unsolicited material yep. and then we all know what happened in March 2020 but yes COVID hit and I guess everyone's perspective on the world I think changed at that moment mm -hmm. and I just left it I just let the book sit for a bit we'd also just moved house and I then read a book by a guy called David Goggins, who is an ex-US Navy SEAL and has a book out called Can't Hurt Me. Reading that really inspired me to realise that I didn't have to sit and wait for anyone else to tell me the book was good enough yeah. and wait for someone to come and do the work for me. I had everything I needed within my capabilities to make it happen for myself. So I decided I could do this. And if I was going to do it, I wasn't going to do it for me, I, I wanted to make a difference if I could. Now, granted, I've only sold 15 copies so far, so I'm not sure I've done all the good I'd, I'd really like to do yet. It's plenty um, time. <laughs> but yeah, then I thought, well, how can I do this? Well, I don't know if I have the experience or the financial means right now to invest in pushing forward to the picture book, but I do think the audiobook entry to market would be more feasible. And a family friend of ours is called Michael Maloney. He's oh. been in lots of different things. The Young Victoria, he's the audiobook reader for Captain Corelli's Mandolin. And he Ooh. also recently played Edward Heath in season three of The Crown, which people might more immediately recognise if you want something very recent. So I reached out to him. I remember him from family gatherings and his mum was in the room when my mum was born because she was my granny's best friend. So that's how tight the relationship is between the grandmothers. That's our relationship with Michael. I hadn't spoken to him for years and he kindly agreed to do it. He said wow. he'd be happy to read the book. Like he took a big risk for his brand because, you know, I'm an unknown author with a story, but he felt the story was good enough and did a great reading. It's a fantastic reading. Yeah. Like, doing a children's book where you're selling to young children, it's as much the illustrator as the narrator, as the author. So it's totally a teamwork between myself, Michael, and then Maggie Roberts, who I didn't know at all, randomly reached out to because I saw her work and thought she looked great. And she mm -hmm. kindly agreed to do the light touch illustrations that have been done so far for the book. So it just shows you what can happen when people rally behind a cause, really, which I I find is just a really great thing to see that people can come together and do something. I know this is a very small level, small scale thing, but it really gives hope when you've got a cause and a product that you can bring the right people around you to help make a difference. So I think that was my favorite part of the process, to be honest, um, reconnecting with an old family friend, meeting a new one and understanding the power of collaboration for a cause. Yeah, wow. Well, I mean, that's wonderful. And I completely agree with you. Michael does do a fantastic job. Wonderful to listen to in all the character voices and gets the rhythm of the rhymes just right. It's, yeah, perfect. I'm very glad that your granny's had that connection that meant you could <laughs> yeah, me um, <laughs> get in touch with them. It's fabulous. <laughs> I was going to say about that because, like you say, the kind of picture books, is, they've got two halves of them, haven't they? They've got the amazing illustrations and then they've also got 
the rhythm and the rhyme that you so often get in those kind of books. And when you've got someone there that's willing to read it out to you in the silly voices as many times as you want, then that's great. But I think that's something that's really brilliant about you doing this audio is that if people don't have someone there that can read that out to them or quite as many times as they might want it repeated again and again, as we all know kids are like that, um, then yeah, they've got Michael's amazing narration there that's just fab. But I think you raise a really great point there as well, Poppy, because I think, and this is what I'm finding now trying to sell the book, people like a tangible copy of the book in their children's hands and in their Mm. hands to read together. And as you say, some children don't have that opportunity to sit down and have a story read aloud to them or not as often as they'd like. And sometimes Mm. I think as a parent, you would like to look for something other than screen time to occupy your children with when they can't read for themselves yet. So an audio book is a really great replacement and I guess something to introduce to the play area and we actually have a Tony box that we recorded flamingo fashion onto one of the creative Tonys so my kids listen to it a lot and I do particularly Mm. enjoy listening to my 22 month old impersonating Michael's laugh for the lion is quite funny oh Um, (laughs) that sounds adorable But I think what it has shown me watching the children listen to this is my son, I promise you that I have not forced this book on my kids and (laughs) my son can pretty much recite it word for word because the thing with audio books that you get is it helps children develop their emotional intelligence as they are not just looking at words, they're hearing them read with the emphasis and Mm. the emotion that helps them understand how these words they are hearing should be used. So that's hugely valuable. And the other piece, and this is why I'm in two minds about doing a full picture book, is because listening to an audio book, you have to use your imaginations. Mm. The children don't just have the imagery in front of them. They have to transcend their minds and activate their creativity to visualize what they think is happening, which is such a key technique to developing creativity and creativity and helping people unlock their creativity is a huge passion of mine. And I think that's one of the biggest values and takeaways I've had from going the audiobook route. And also, my understanding is that sometimes when people are learning to read, they will play the audiobook and they will follow along with the written manuscript, which is why you have a hidden version of the manuscript on Kindle, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because I had to publish that to publish the audiobook on Audible. And um, in the vague hope that if someone did want to advance their language skills, they could listen to the audio and follow along. And I have absolutely zero connection to this woman in Brazil who left a lovely review on Amazon. She was actually using the book to learn English. So, you know, that was a really great review for me because it was meaning that the book was meeting some part of the goal I had for it. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think I spotted that review and it's fab. I agree with it. And I've do a bit of language learning myself and trying to find stuff that's at kind of a reasonable level that you can be able to understand it but it's also really fun and engaging and getting that listening experience in there which is so much harder than the kind of reading stuff is really good so yeah I'm glad about that review too and also like you're saying about imagination I think that's sort of a a weird but wonderful contradiction in that it's a book that's so full of discussion about appearance and colour and yet you're not actually giving the audience any of that. They have to make that all up themselves, but that also means they're not limited in any way. You know, it can be as colourful as as their imagination wants to make it. And I think that's quite wonderful. Yeah, that's a great point. I had to visualise it when I wrote it. So I guess it's only fair to make everyone else (laughs) do the same. (laughs) So on your website, there's a whole list of activities to kind of inspire children's creativity. And so I was just wondering... How that came about, was that always part of the plan as part of the book release or was that something that was generated kind of more organically and what do you hope for children to kind of get out the activities on the Fashion Flamingo website? Yeah, so for parents who might be listening, there's so many kids classes out there now, even at your library or at museums where they bring to life a book with artistic activities and then we'll read the story. So activating the children's learning and imagination through the book. And I've really enjoyed myself attending these classes and doing the art activities with my then three-year-old, because at that time, really, you're the one doing it, (laughs) (laughs) assisting the sticking parts. And having done that a lot really opened my mind to the potential with Flamingo Fashion. So I teamed up with Jill from Jolly Bookworms, which is a local phonics 
reading class in Hertfordshire and St Albans because I thought she was fantastic at the way in which she activated the stories that she was reading as part of her classes. And she kindly, again, it's all a generous collaboration of time and creativity, worked with me to think about the activities for Flamingo Fashion on the website. And my hope for the activities there is a way to activate imaginations, to get children applying their own design thinking. There's an activity there to design their own animal outfit, which is free association creativity. There are more applied activities, which will help with motor skills for younger children and just getting hands on with craft making. It's also a good, what should we do on a rainy afternoon type craft activities Mm. for parents. My particular favourite is the giraffe in the story as a dancer and there is a activity to make a homemade disco ball and then have a dance party afterwards. So dancing is another great form of creative expression. So there's a lot there. And also I really enjoy the children's obviously mocktail making, which Beaver Drinks kindly helped deliver a recipe to help with that activity as well. That's really cool. And so obviously we know you're very creative, but we can't and the listeners can't see you at the moment. How do you describe your fashion? Are you a, are you a flamingo pink or do you? <laughs> I, um, this is funny, actually, because I've been having this conversation. So I, um, <laughs> I just paint a picture. I have a 22 month old girl and I have an almost four year old boy mm-hmm. and they consume my day. Yeah, I, They've both now started going to nursery and school. So I have about four or five hours to do a bit of work three days a week. So maybe this is the irony of this whole entire book. <laughs> I, I, my fashion is put on some clothes, hope the kids don't wreck it by the end of the day so that when <laughs> I pick them up from school, I look somewhat immaculate. But I'm a comfort dresser. So maybe my fancy for you know those days where you do get to dress up came out in writing yeah. flamingo fashion. But I'm very much a yoga leggings and a jumper type person. Nice. <laughs> and I guess... They are in pink. There is, I do have ah, pink in the wardrobe. Go. There we go. <laughs> oh, that's fab. And yes, definitely a good plan. And I'm definitely with you with the comfy clothes, though less so with you with the pink. But that's okay. <laughs> we're, we're all different. <laughs> so you're donating all the sales profits to Lit World. Could you tell us a little bit about the charity and why you decided to become associated with them? Yeah. So this all came about when I lived in New York for seven years and I was walking through Manhattan talking to a friend of mine who is a leader of corporate social responsibility for the organization I used to work for. And she had mentioned that the organization I work for is really supporting children's literacy. So didn't really think much about it until like a year and a half later when I was coming to think about, well, where does the money go to if I want to make a difference? Mm -hmm. And then obviously the seed was planted and that came out. And I thought, well, I've written a children's audio book. What better charity to support than a children's literacy charity? So I Googled and wrote, you know, best children's literacy charities and a whole list of great charities out there came up and Lit World grabbed my attention because they focus not just on helping children learn to read and write, but also to help them develop their own creative confidence. So they really help children through learning to read and write, build their confidence in their own identity and be able to express their own story. I really latched onto that concept and that's why I picked them. They're also based in New York. They are quite a small charity, which I also think is a great way to go because some of the really great, huge charities get a lot of money comparatively, Mm. whereas I wanted to help and support a smaller organization to achieve what they're looking to do. They also at the time, I'm not sure if that's still the case because I haven't been able to find the link on the website, were collaborating with an organization called Glow on the Her Story campaign. And I really loved the idea about how they were focusing on helping specifically girls and women empower themselves through reading and writing to be able to tell their story and create change in their communities. Because in a country like the UK, where education is free, and I guess there is an assumption Mm -hmm. that all children are able to access it, which is definitely an assumption, we perhaps take our ability to read and write for granted. 
and Lit World have is their belief that literacy is not a gift for the chosen few. It's a fundamental human right. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree with that more. Reading is how we learn. It's how we grow. And it's how we dream. Because when we're informed by different information sets and our minds are opened to worlds that perhaps we didn't know exist, that's what gives us the power and insight and the inspiration to act. What Lit World is trying to do is help children read, write, have the confidence to share their story and make change for their individual level, but also at a community level and maybe even a world level, because where we have more information, we can start making different and more informed decisions and the actions that we take. Yeah, I think that's fantastic, Sam. I think one of the things that the past year or so has shown us is how important stories are to people. You know, pretty much everyone turned to kind of Netflix or audiobooks or some stories to find a comfort or mm. respite or a escape from the day-to-day -day situation of kind of being locked inside a house for, you know, close to 24 hours a day. And I think it is essential for everyone to be able to read in order to gain access to that comfort and that escapism. So yeah, it's a fantastic thing that you've done. Well, I've only sold 15 copies yeah. yet, so I'm I'm working on it. But what yeah. I have decided is that I've recently just starting up to go out on my own as a consultant. And I've decided that when my company, and if my company makes money, <laughs> I will continue to support this charity. But I wanted to also pick up on the point about how we've all been turning to stories. Stories are basically how humans have been communicating for, I don't know if we can think how far back in time yeah. stories have been part of the way in which we connect as humans. And one of the stories in Lit World's research report is about a woman in an African village. And she had heard about these Lit World camps for children, I believe, and sought to find whether she could create one for adults because she was a woman in her community. She was HIV positive and she couldn't read or write and wanted to learn. And she set up the first Lit World Club for adults in her community to help other women come and share their stories and connect and learn. And I think she framed it as seeing hope and a way forwards. And I think that, again, was something that really opened my eyes to the power of reading and writing and storytelling, not just at a child level, but at the adult level. I think we're all perhaps those of us who can read and write and listen, can hear a story, but learning how to tell a story and connect with others through a story is a skill that I think even I, I definitely could do better at as an adult. So that was another thing that really stood out for me. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a, a wonderful cause to support. I think that's fabulous. And speaking of your writing, which I do think is great, um, I wanted to ask about how do you kind of come up with your rhymes and things that's obviously quite a difficult skill but also quite a fun one to play around with those rhymes and stuff again both kids and adults doing that kind of creative thing how do you work yours do you sort of know which words you're going to rhyme and work backwards do they just naturally come brilliantly formed as uh, as rhyming pairs what kind of thing do you do for that yeah this is the hardest part and a bit that annoyed my husband the most because <laughs> I'd literally be sitting there counting syllables on my fingers but there's a, a hidden lady who supported me in this called Sandra Glover, who was a mentor that I had found through Cornerstones Literary Consulting. They're an organization who help authors maybe with editing or coaching through the writing process. And Sandra challenged every single line and pretty much every mm. single word. She didn't give anything to me. She challenged me and pushed me to go beyond what I had. I've started getting into this whole Instagram thing, which is perhaps not my bag, but <laughs> I'm giving it a go. And yeah. I <laughs> I found an old paragraph and I literally read one of the first drafts and it wasn't good. <laughs> and this would be a message for people who perhaps feel, I mean, there's the saying, isn't there? We've all got a book inside of us. So if someone is feeling inspired and feels they do have a book inside and it's a children's picture book and they want to write it, Start with the story first. That's what I did. I came up with mm -hmm. the rough concept and then an audio book or a picture book, how these sound in the mouth is really important. Yeah. So they have to feel good to say. 
So you have to look at it from that level. Then you have to look at it from the perfect rhyming level for each part that you're rhyming. And then the rhythm level. So you have to ensure that the syllable count is correct on every single line. So I'd literally sit there watching TV, imagining lines in my head and thinking about how I could reorder the syntax and also what words might be better placed because another key feature is show, don't tell. Yeah. The line about a sherbet pink river surging through the grass, that is massively showing in terms of giving a visual for everyone's outfits washing through the African plains. I think for me, landing that line was when I realized that I was starting to get the idea of how you do it. (laughs) So yeah, for me, the whole book was a learning process. I had an idea. I had a reasonable amount of handle of the English language to have a bash and definitely had read Mm. enough picture books to give me insight into what good looked like. But I definitely needed coaching and help on the way to turn what was pretty mediocre into a reasonable book for people to listen to. <laughs> See, that's kind of part of the reason why I never try sort of like poetry or verse, because it's just kind of like trying to reorganize those lines into a way that gets into a rhythm where it's just... I remember finding great difficulty with that at school. So it's just, you know, you taking that approach to make sure that the, you know, as you say, it sounds good when you're reading out loud is not easy. Yeah. And all your hard work clearly paid off. There's a lot of picture books that are fabulous and a lot of my favorites where you just have that odd line that really, it doesn't quite work, does it? But yeah, from what you're saying, you've clearly been trying really hard to just not let that be a thing. And yeah, it, it shows. Yeah, well, I I should also say perhaps, you know, rhyming couplets isn't your bag. (laughs) Mm. My mum, when I was growing up, used to write treasure hunt clues and they were all rhyming. So Mm. my mum is another unsung hero on this book because she literally sat there with me thrashing out some of the lines that I was really struggling with because this is her bag. And obviously, I have been influenced through my creative inheritance, shall we say, from my mum. So I just definitely should give a shout out to my mum. That's what most people do, isn't it? On any sort of radio show or TV (laughs) show anyway. (laughs) I think so, yes. (laughs) So speaking of influence then, after your forgivable, I guess, break in children's books, what was your favourite one or favourite ones? Can you pick a few that really stick with you? Yes. So I am a massive fan of Peter Bentley's books. We found Mm. those magnificent sheep in their flying machine in a small library on the Upper East Side. And I fell in love with that because it's funny. The rhyme is perfect. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of world travel in it as well, just to give the kids an insight into Mm. what's out there. Perhaps not a Yeti, but, you know, at least he introduced the idea of Nepal. And then I love the Shifty McGifty books as well. The ones that I think there's also ones out there for older readers, but the ones that are rhyming for young children. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed those ones. And the Rachel Bright books, obviously, the Koala. Yes. Who could story? And the Lion Inside. Yes. And the Squirrels that Squabbled. And I know I'm forgetting one of my really favorite ones, but the other one, which I really apologize, I can't remember the author, but it's from the Tiger Press series, is The Monkey with the Blue Bottom is also really fun, which I found online. Love that story. Oh, that's wonderful. So that's the thing. I was definitely inspired. There is a plethora of amazing creative talent for children's book writing out there. I appreciate that there's probably one big name missing from what I've just shared, which is obviously (laughs) Julia Donaldson, but I thought it would be refreshing to share someone other. (laughs) As I was working on this, Sandra was like, Julia's the standard. So she was definitely someone who is the bar, basically, as I was trying to write the book. Yeah, that's fair. And If a big name does influence you, then you can definitely still say that. But yeah, it's nice that you shared some other ones. And especially Rachel Bright, with this being an audiobook podcast, I didn't think I'd get much chance to really talk about those books, especially the ones that she did with Jim Field doing the illustrations on. But yeah, they they mean a lot to me, um, especially the line inside. So yes, it's nice that uh, thanks to you, been able to talk about them a little bit on on this podcast. That's fine, thanks. Good, good, good. I'm glad to help. (laughs) Definitely. So you kind of mentioned David Goggins earlier on in terms of inspiring you, you giving you the confidence to go off and just do the project, not waiting for permission from anyone. I was just wondering, 
in terms of actually bringing the project together, what was the most challenging part of it? And if there was any advice that you're going to give to writers or creators who would be embarking on kind of the same path, what thing that you know now would you kind of advise them to be wary of or kind of look out for when they're starting their project? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I guess I'll, I'll take the last piece first, which is if you have an idea and you're passionate about it, then sit down, get a first version of it out and see if you really think you've got something. Because I think often what can happen is we'll share that we have ideas and can let our own conscious mind and our own judgment of ourselves and fear of what others might say get in the way of us actually even taking action to get the idea out of our heads onto paper. Mm. So my first piece would be, if you've got an idea and you think it's good, put it down on paper and then take a, a second look. Don't let fear cripple you before you've even taken the first jump. My mum is my biggest supporter well, one of my biggest supporters, I should say, my dad being the other one and, and my husband. But when I shared the idea initially with her, she wasn't that into it. Uh, maybe I caught her an off moment. Um, <laughs> but I believed in the idea enough that I discarded that point of view and went ahead anyway. <laughs> and now my mum's the biggest fan of, of the book. So that's just a case in point. If you believe in it and you're passionate about it, do it, write it. And then from there, when you've got the first draft, then it does get a bit more challenging because you have to start playing with the art of it. There is lines that I really, really liked that I first did, mm -hmm. and I had to break them and change them and throw away, quote unquote, the babies and put something else yeah. in, which was very challenging, but also hugely helped enable creative breakthrough. If you're not passionate about it, you won't have the energy to push through the harder moments. It would be easier to leave it on the side so you have to have passion and belief and also fun to be honest it should be a fun process it shouldn't be a bashing your head like I enjoyed the challenge of trying to craft the wording it wasn't easy it doesn't come naturally to me I hate detail but I believed in it enough that it kept me going so that would be a really big insight into coming up with your own projects the most challenging piece has honestly been the marketing <laughs> mm. like when you sit down to write a book you think, okay, I've got the story. There we go. Great. Then you have to get it on the editing suite. And that's tough in terms of pushing you to go beyond what you thought were your creative limit was. And then you get it out into the world. And then you have to navigate the publishing industry, which is honestly one of the hardest industries I have ever come across in trying to get an in anywhere. Yeah. Um, it's tough. And that's another reason why I went the audiobook route to be a master of my own destiny because I wasn't willing for it to just sit on a computer and never be seen. I wanted it to be out there. I felt it should be out there. And, and that's another reason why I went the audiobook route. But the marketing piece, do not <laughs> underestimate it. It's mm. hard. Like I've gone onto Instagram. I have done a flamingo dance in my back garden with my best mate to encourage people. I've tried to create viral videos. I've tried to create viral poses. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've done quote unquote inspirational messages about writing and creating, highlighting the cause and the charity. It's tough. I am so grateful for you taking the time to oh, nice. be on your podcast because for me, this is a big deal and I'm so grateful. I really hope lots of people, whether they, well, I hope lots of people listen and go and buy the book, not just because the book is good, but to support the cause. Also, if you download Audible and you've never used it before, it comes with free credits. And if you use those free credits to the book, that's money that still goes to the charity. So it's a very easy way to give money to charity for free. <laughs> so yeah, those are my insights. So believe in what you've got, get the first draft out, play with the potential, challenge yourself, be prepared for the challenge. It's not all easy and find your way through the publishing industry in a way that is authentic to you and market. If you know someone famous, you're one step further ahead than me. Yeah. <laughs> well, apart from Michael, of course. Oh yeah, yeah I know, I know.
<laughs> I haven't I haven't asked him to pull on his Hollywood links. I think he's done yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. And I think they're great bits of advice. And I'm so glad that you're so happy to be here because we're definitely happy to have you. Yeah. It's the first author interview that I've done as a proper kind of speaking interview. And that's really exciting. So, yes, thank you very much. Well, one thing we haven't got around to talking about yet is the music that kind of opens and closes the audiobook. Oh, yes. Um, I love brilliant. it. I know yeah, that it brilliant. is, yes. Yeah. I know that I would definitely have been annoying my mum with singing it along <laughs> over and over again if I had had this when I was younger. Might still do that now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. How did that come about? And yeah, how did you get that on there, especially with you doing this kind of more on your own than with a publisher? Yes. So another person who's been part of this team, and thank you for bringing this up, who hasn't come up yet, is a guy called Rob Lawrence, who I met through starting to set up my own podcast. And mm. I'm really grateful for that connection because obviously he's helping with the podcast and he's great. So insightful about the podcast industry and all the equipment you need. So you should have a good recording for this because I got the stuff. Oh, nice. <laughs> but he produced Flamingo Fashion as the audiobook. And he shared this huge ream of places where you can go and choose music because there's obviously lots of platforms out there. The one I used was Tune Tank and the piece mm -hmm. is called Funny Situation. <laughs> I heard it and was like, this couldn't be more perfect for the book. So apologies, I do not know who composed it, but it was Tune Tank, Funny Situation. <laughs> and I just downloaded it from there. So that was the story. I know there are people out there who have podcasts who've got older children who've designed the music for it, but it was nothing creative like that. <laughs> That's totally fair, but you're right. You've found the right thing. Yeah. So I'm very like sniffy around music in audiobooks. Like for me, it has to be just right or just leave it. Don't put it in there. So your choice of that song was, it works really well. My husband loves music. There's music on in this house all the time. The first thing he'll do into a room that's quiet is put on some music. So mm. I've definitely been heavily influenced by lots of different music over the last, I guess, 13 years. And both me and my husband heard it and we used our instinct, creative instincts, I guess, based on what we've heard in the past to know whether we felt this would fit. I guess I will credit my husband for my creative instinct on this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned there in your last answer about a podcast that you're doing, if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'd love to. So the podcast is called Natural Born Thinkers, and it's a podcast designed to help anyone who listens to live their most creative life, to embrace a more creative lifestyle. So I believe that everybody is wired to be creative. It's a belief set or a choice not to think that you are creative. We all have the biological potential. It's just a case of learning the techniques to unlock it and practicing them and getting good at it. So I believe that creativity is for everyone. Everyone is born to think differently. We are all shaped by entirely different experiences, which give us our own unique set of creative stock, shall we say, to draw on. And we need the diverse ideas of everybody to help make change in this world. And that's that's the connection back to children's literacy on this one. If we need everyone to read and be formed and knowledgeable and have creative ideas and be able to express them to help create change in the world. So it's all about helping people live a most creative lifestyle. I've interviewed a range of people. These aren't big, you know, famous in a magazine type folk that I'm interviewing. These are all professionals in their own right. So I've got business professionals. One of them is my uncle who just happens to be a volcanologist and a movie maker, mm -hmm. which is quite an interesting combination. And also an old swimming coach of mine to learn about creativity and how we can bring it into our life from lots of different areas. So hopefully something in there for everyone and I'm really passionate about it and have the tagline born to think differently as a reminder that we all have the capability to do it. And when is that going to be launched? Uh, so hopefully in the next few weeks, I have just gone through the editing suite with the six I've done and getting the website up and then going on this adventure of entrepreneurship. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, sounds really exciting. I know I've launched three podcasts and congratulations for doing it, first of all. But yeah, it's exciting and it's challenging and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it loads. 
what's the next book going to be? Oh, the next book. Yes. So I wrote two books before I wrote Flamingo Fashion. I wrote one about the gorilla in the garden because my son came home from nursery and saying, I don't want to go in the garden. There's a gorilla in there, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> and, <laughs> so I wrote this book about a gorilla who causes mayhem in the garden because I don't know if there are other parents out there who sometimes open the window in the morning and wonder how on earth the garden came to look the way it does. <laughs> So there is a culprit. It is the gorilla in the garden. So I need to revisit that one. And there was one about a spider as well. And I'm also trying to pen a first draft of Roger the racehorse. Maybe his name will change, but there's a family Mm. joke about why his name is Roger because of some horses that lived in the fields opposite us when we grew up. The theme of that will be making your own luck in life. You make your own luck in life. You don't just get lucky. So Awesome. I can't wait for them. <laughs> I'd literally hold your horses on that one. Because I will wait for them. I will wait for them, but I don't want to. Yeah. They, they need a lot of work. So I've got to get back into the counting syllables game. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us today. We, I think I can speak for Poppy as well. We both really enjoyed the book. Yeah, definitely. Fantastically performed and produced. Where can people find you on the internet and social media and all that good stuff, Sam? Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, so the book is on Audible. And if you want the manuscript, please don't review the manuscript for not having enough pictures in it. It is a manuscript, mm. <laughs> which I've had a few of those. That can be found on Kindle if you want to read along. There is some really great imagery in there by Maggie Roberts to bring some of the key personalities in the book to life. And I have an Instagram page, which is at Flamingo Fashion Book. It's not just me reposting, thanking people for liking my page or whatever, which (laughs) I find quite frustrating. I do try to put up some original content about the book, about the cause, and also about unlocking your creative potential. And I have the website, which is flamingofashionbook.squarespace. If people are interested in pursuing their creative lifestyle, Natural Born Thinkers, has an Instagram handle of at Natural Born Thinkers for now. And there will be a website, which hopefully will be (laughs) www.naturalbornthinkers.com. So yeah, this is quite exciting. That is our first author interview done. Um, Poppy, any closing comments you want to make? I don't think so. I think we covered everything. It's a wonderful book, supporting a wonderful cause. And uh, yeah, great for kids and adults alike. Okay, so I think our next episode will be... No Fixed Abode by Maeve McGinnigan, and it's a expose of the housing crisis in the UK that was started off with an investigation that was looking at how many homeless people were dying in the UK. So that's going to be our next episode. Uh, once again, thank you, Sam. Thank, thank you, you Poppy. So much. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed myself, and I really wish you the best of luck with audio bookish as well. I hope everyone listens. Oh, you're more than welcome. And yeah, the pleasure's all ours. And great luck to you too. That's very kind of you. Okay, guys, let's say uh, goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.